this exhibition came to fruition thanks to a generous donation of 45 landscape paintings to the college. Part of the late Dr. Elliot Vassell's collection of American art, these works were donated in honor of Dr. Vassell by his daughter, Hilary Peary Vassell, with the intent that they be put on public display. Dr. Elliot Vassell and his wife, Kristen, had been generous patrons to the gallery since its founding in 1994 and had loaned works from this distinctive collection for several past exhibitions at the gallery. I want to let everyone know that this lecture is being recorded this evening and will be available online at the gallery's website. We are extremely fortunate this evening to have as our guest speaker, Dr. Gerald L. Carr, one of the foremost authorities on artist Frederick N. Wooden Church and the Hudson River School painters. Dr. Carr received his BA in Humanities from Michigan State University and an MA and PhD in Art History from the University of Michigan. He has taught at five American colleges and universities. A published photographer as well as an art historian, he has authored and co-authored eight books and numerous articles and reviews on 19th century American, British, and French art and architecture. His books on church include, from 1994, a catalog raisonné of the works of art at Olana State Historic Site. And as a matter of fact, I was just looking online, Amazon is offering this book for $3,360. So if you have a copy, you're lucky. His other books on church include Frederick Edwin Church, Romantic Landscapes and Seascapes, Frederick Church, A Painter's Pilgrimage, and In Search of the Promised Land, paintings by Frederick Edwin Church. And all of which we found, other than the catalog Grazenay, <laughs> in the American Art Book Collection of Dr. Vassell that he had generously uh, donated to the gallery. One of Dr. Carr's current projects is a book on church's work in Lebanon, and we look forward to his, its publication and his discussion of that this evening. As a special treat for this evening only, we have on display in the gallery church's 1868 painting, Ruins at Baalbek. When we think of the Hudson River School, we often think of American locales. This work is unique in churches of, and it is indeed a rare opportunity to have Dr. Carr on hand to speak about it. Dr. Carr is joined by his wife, Dr. Anne Marie Whale Carr this evening, who is a distinguished scholar in her own right and whose work takes her to the island of Cyprus. And this is where I first met Dr. Carr. Dr. Carr's le lecture this evening is entitled Camels, Caravans, and Keystones, Frederick Edwin Church and Lebanon. I'm pleased to present Dr. Gerald Carr. Thank you. Thank you very much for coming tonight. I'm getting accustomed to new glasses and a cataract operation of only a few weeks ago. So I hope I can read my typed out notes. Anyway, thanks very much, Barbara, for the gracious introduction. The current exhibition, a contemplation of scenery, the Vassell family collection, comprises 45 small to medium-sized landscape paintings in one small etching. Most are 19th century American. All but the etching were generously donated 
to the college by Hilary Peary Vassell, daughter of their modern gatherer, the late Dr. Elliot Vassell. Last spring, I asked, hopefully, if churches, ruins at Baalbek, 1868. Now let's see, where are we? I'm jumping ahead, right might be lent uh, to uh, the gallery for the time of my talk. It's an oil on canvas, three feet wide. The title is Modern. Its original titles, two similar early ones are documented, were Syria and the Lebanon Mountains and the Lebanon Mountains. Both comprise the word Lebanon. Mr. Church is my art historical specialty. Partly because Dr. Vazell was also an art historian, I hope you'll abide my presenting throughout research and reconnection, emphasizing certain Near Eastern ingredients, among them Lebanon, Baalbek, camels, caravans, and keystones. I will highlight certain dates, 1867 to 69 and 1878 to 79, avoiding the words romantic, as in romantic landscape, and exotic, Neither will I use the phrase Hudson River School, although I know it best. Trust me. Let's go for a ride. Church's ruins at Baalbek, AKA Syria and the Lebanon Mountains was itself a keystone. It was his first Mediterranean themed studio picture. The lone depicted figure amidst the subdued scene is a pipe smoking Arab goat herder. A touring American church had met at Beirut commissioned the picture. Church painted it during his only transatlantic sojourn lifetime. That journey, which occurred between November 1867 and June 1869, was a family affair, accompanied by his wife, oh, come on now. Let's go that way, okay. His wife, um, whose name was Isabel, uh, his young son and his, mother, his uh, um, uh, mother-in-law, uh, he toured um, the Near East, beginning essentially at Beirut. He began ruins at Baalbek at Beirut, only a couple of days worth apparently, where they lived for five months, January to May 1868, and he finished it at Rome late that year. I think it fitting that my talk today occurs at a place called Lebanon, near a town called Lebanon, not far from another town called Palmyra, all situated in eastern Pennsylvania. Farther north in Wayne County, there's a Damascus township within which there are villages named Damascus, West Damascus, and Galilee, not far from, you got a hint from it, towns named Bethlehem and, yes, New Jerusalem. My wife and I traveled to Mediterranean Lebanon four times between 2016 and 2019. Here are two maps of Lebanon, the one on the right, kind of illegible, but it shows the uh, 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 topography a, a bit better in uh, quasi-relief. Lebanon is a small country packed tight. Its geography divides between an elongated coast, sloping hills, two paralleling interior mountain ranges, the Lebanon and anti-Lebanon, and an elongated valley, the Baca Valley, between. Coastal Beirut is Lebanon's principal city, but historically three other cities, Tyre and Sidon to the south, Tripoli to the north, all coastal, were more important. Baalbek is in the Baca Valley in the middle. Seen from, here's uh, an aerial view of uh, Lebanon, uh, excuse me, uh, Beirut, uh, a few years ago when things were uh, decent. And this is uh, uh, a set piece of three of my photographs of uh, Baalbek. Well, anyway, I was about to say, seen from the air and from the Bacal Valley, from the air here and from the Bacal Valley twice here, the mountain snow patterns resemble giant zebra stripes. When the church family was there, Baalbek comprised a few simple houses among the Roman ruins. And all Lebanon today is mostly Muslim, 
but originally it was more diversely Christian. Arabian and otherwise today's nights there are heartbreaking, fraught, and fretful. This is the New York Times just about a month ago. Three more things. First, visual arts everywhere nowadays are in myriad respects way different than Frederick Church's time. This is Selma Hayek. sorry, this is Frida at the Museum of Modern Art. This is a big painting by Frederick Church as of a few years ago. It's still in the gallery, but not quite so near at hand. And the ladies are taking photographs of themselves in front of it, I think not knowing much what they're looking at, but it's a big picture, elaborately framed, and it must be important. Well, now it's high rise and you can't get that near to it. In any case, in New York City, one of Church's adoptive hometowns, things are different as well. Second, period changes over art, arch less nowadays than you might think. For one thing, Judeo-Christian scripture and Greco-Roman classical antiquity have beckoned Euro-American creativities for centuries. They still do. These are two modern, AKA, renderings of the Supreme Court by New York publications. Mediterranean classical architecture continues resonant for Europeans and Americans, if only because government buildings often flaunt it. For another thing, primordial perceptions of human elitism persist. By the late 1850s, his early or mid 30s, Frederick Church had become an American celebrity internationally as well as nationally. Here's a news clip about him in the early 1870s. In an increasingly print media driven period, he rarely if ever wrote press releases himself, but he recognized their value. Numbers of his studio pictures, some of his sketches, and to a degree incidents in his life and presumed personal traits were all treated as print media commodities. As was already customary for prominent persons, portrait photographs of him were circulated during his life and even afterward. This one is recapitulated from 1901, the year after he died. And after Church died, a former friend of his confessed that he had sold several letters from the artist for their autographs, for the money. And third, Church himself was rarely in a bad mood. Personally, he was prankish and loved jokes and puns, verbal puns. Artistically, he drew cartoons even on his letters and separate cartoons. These are two examples, one of each. And in his studio, he seldom painted tragedy, although occasionally he did collect it. Here's a print he owned of, as you can see, uh, people shoreline trying to contend with tragedy. He also owned an English translation of Dante's Vision, published in 1850. His own Mediterranean paintings involving architectural ruins are meditative, not morose. Frederick Church was born and grew up in Hartford, Connecticut. He remained loyal to his birthplace. In his late teens, he became a student of Thomas Cole's on the left at Catskill, New York, where, whereupon he, Church, developed strong attachments to that locale as well. After a brief interval back in Hartford, he moved to Manhattan. Then, in 1860, he returned to upstate New York across the Hudson River from the town of Catskill. I offer you very briefly four representative Western Hemisphere studio paintings by Church. Among his grandest and most acclaimed, Niagara, 1857, The Heart of the Andes, 1859, Twilight in the Wilderness, 1860, and Rainy Season in the Tropics, 1866, all depict nature with a capital N, a common word in those days with little or no human footprint. Of those works, Niagara was more or less topographical. The others were composed, that is to say, imagined. For some of Church's contemporaries, the tropical paintings just cited had Arabian Nights flavors. Look at the palm trees in rainy season 
in the tropics. They're arabesque forms, you could say. To that degree, and maybe others, the Western Hemisphere tropics, as Church revisioned them, were Orientalist before he had walked among actual Orientals. Another thing to keep in mind, images of palm trees pervaded 19th century European literature about the Near East as emblematic of that region. They still do. On the left, 1839. On the right, 2021. Mr. Church, however, reserved palms for equatorial America. Of the paintings just mentioned, rainy season most invites symbolic interpretation. Yes, the heart of the Andes is larger, has a crucifix and missing church within it, and was accompanied at its public debut by two printed pamphlets, one of them written by a voluble Protestant clergyman. But rainy season exalts and exults. Thomas Cole had composed several overt allegories, singly and in series, the majority involving fictive architecture, intact and ruined. Cole had termed his pictorial purposes moral. That's a word he used. That's a word press writers used. As a young artist, Church painted several large historical pictures. The biggest, 1851, was a deluge, the biblical deluge. Sketches for it are extant, the painting is lost. And here are the two sketches that survive. His version of the often imagined scenario comprised a distant doomed water size settlement and nearer an eagle flying and two humans and a tiger sharing a teetering rock ledge. But after 1851, a pivotal year for him, he stopped doing history. Almost. Winter of 1861, he painted a small upright arch top nighttime scene adapted from Thomas Cole's largest picture ever, The Angel Appearing to the Shepherds, 1834. Church knew Cole's picture well. Church's picture was for him hypothetically upliftingly Syrian. It hypothetically includes a tall palm tree. He painted his for himself and his wife, a keepsake for their first married Christmas together. Fast forward to November 1867. The churches departed from New York Harbor accompanied by close friends. In Paris, where they'd all proceeded from Le Havre, Mr. Church might have done more than he did what could have summoned in-person intercontinental opportunity for him, he sidestepped. Instead, he looked around the French capital, we know he did that much, then went to London for a week, surveying paintings and sketches by J.M.W. Turner, a longtime idol of his. Then he resumed overseas movements. Church's transatlantic agenda was low-key in the U.S. and even lower in Europe. That sounds like Mr. Church to me. He never gave a public speech or wrote an essay and just once, as far as I'm aware of, sent a letter to a newspaper. It was printed. Thomas Cole had done all of those things. Fortunately, somebody said something about Church prior to his transatlantic trip. Days before the Church's Manhattan departure, a one paragraph preview on the left was printed in a local newspaper. Next day, a slightly adjusted version was printed in New York. The publicist was probably Church's New York art dealer named of Michael Nerdler. Neither text mentioned Church's family, nor prospective studio paintings, nor continental Europe, or the British Isles. Both reports cited one destination only, specifically Beirut, generally Syria. The East, the Near East, had lured Americans as well as Europeans for decades. Southern Europe and the Near East comprised an array of thriving, diminished, and vanished settlements where peoples, events, and religions, and art had interwoven for millennia. The churches went East right then for their own reasons, not least because their first two children had died both of diphtheria with a 10-day period during March 1865. 
Two and a half years later, having begun rebuilding his family, Mr. Church desired, as usual, to broaden his horizons, but his aspirations were those of a married man, still beset by personal suffering. From the outset, the churches aimed toward Ottoman Syria, still often called the Holy Land. It encompassed present-day Syria, Lebanon, Jordan, Israel, and Palestine. Mr. Church also had mainland Greece strongly in mind. Via Marseille and Messina, Sicily, after alighting at Alexandria, Egypt, he headed his family to Beirut. At Beirut, they settled where they'd landed at a waterfront hotel, January to May 1868. They went to Beirut largely because of the newly founded Syrian Protestant College, today's American University at Beirut, and the people then associated with it. They had already met one or more of those persons in the US. A decade and a half later, in the early 1880s, the Massachusetts-based writer Susan Hale, who became a close friend of the churches, affectionately recollected Beirut. She and her sister had encountered the churches there and at Jerusalem in 1868. In her book, published in 1882, that's her with her brother Edward Everett Hale on the right, Susan Hale wrote, and this is a print from her book, it is impossible that a city should be more beautiful than Beirut. It stands on a promontory running along the base of the Lebanon mountains into the Mediterranean facing toward the west. It has the advantage over cities on the north and south shores of that sea at looking directly across it toward the setting sun. It is a town of, listen to what she says next, large population of which the greater part are strangers, English and American who have done much to advance the cause of education in the East. This is an engraving, repeating what I said, of uh, Beirut, the entering of Beirut by what was the, uh, by then, modern road from Beirut to Damascus and back by horse and, yes, camel caravan. Beirut was a sea port, a nexus for multinational comings and goings, as until fairly recently it remained. That in large measure with, uh, was how Frederick Church regarded it. His Beirut sketches are moment to moment. This one is the nearest of a long perspective topographical sketch he did at Beirut. It's a small sketchbook drawing, but the building on the right the far right, more or less, begins the scrum of buildings in which the church's hotel was situated. Here's another view from the shoreline looking out toward a steamship and a rainbow. And here is the only Beirut area photograph that I'm aware he purchased. It depicts an old over river bridge north of town. From Beirut, he made assorted sea and land expeditions, several with family, notably twice to Jerusalem and once to Damascus and Baalbek, April and May 1868. Baalbek was his prized topographical travel acquisition within Lebanon. Earlier, February, March 1868, he organized from Beirut a six-week potentially hazardous all-male jaunt to and from Petra in present-day Jordan while his kin stayed put in Beirut. In Church's day, Petra, notable for its rock-cut architectural ruins, was mysterious, inhabited by nomadic Bedouins, and difficult of access. At maximum, Church's equipage of the late winter 1868 comprised 21 men, two horses, and 16 camels. A slurry of Church's en route sketch, sketches put him and us midst the caravan. Here is one such at night with camels and Arab attendants. And he did get there. And he did return to Beirut and to Mrs. Church, 
who anxiously awaited him. This is an oil study he did, and it's at Olana, his uh, a former a home, and it's signed and dated 1868. Where do we begin? How about May 1879 and this sheet of images across the front page of that day's issue of the New York Daily Graphic, Manhattan's first daily pictorial newspaper. The occasion was a one-day outing arranged by the junior class for the graduating seniors of Vassar College, a women's school. It's co-ed today at Poughkeepsie, New York. That's downriver from Greenport, New York, where was and is located Frederick and Isabel Church's Persian-style country houses. Country house, shortly to be named by its occupants, Olana, but not quite yet. Mr. Church had designed the house for himself, had it built starting in 1870, and moved his family into it in 1872. Soon it became a local landmark. The Vassar women asked the churches if the group might visit. Frederick L. and Isabel said, yes, great, come on down. So the graphic artist depicted, let's jump ahead again, the ladies, among other ambiences of that day, ascending an Olana carriage rode by horse and buggy. There, the paper's reporter wrote, the ladies and their escorts were in high aesthetic clover. Several other New York and Hudson Valley papers reported the festivities as well. Brief newsprint com uh, summaries reached as far away as Detroit. The Near Eastern flavor of the church's Olana wasn't only Persian. It was Lebanese as well. Frederick and Isabel Church had often ridden donkeys in and around Beirut, 1868. Frederick was so enamored with the light-colored variety that, after returning to the U.S., he reported he imported three of them to ply the carriage roads of his rural estate. At least one of them lived until 1884, when it was pictured by a photographer with the church's daughter and the church's mother-in-law in the carriage here. I would guess that Frederick showed the Vassar ladies all his pampered Mediterranean quadrupeds. Newsprint reports cite no such details. Altogether in May 1879, the artifactual and living Near Eastern modules of a private Hudson Valley estate were garrulously cheerful. Except maybe one exterior feature at Olana, the carved star-shaped keystone of the front facade opening usually called the ombra. Now, where is anything? We're talking about, what I'm about to show you is under the awning right down there. And that thing looks like that. And most of the year, at least in the warmer months, you don't see it because of awnings furled or unfurled in front of it. The motif is pivotal but minuscule Perhaps and perhaps not. The Vassar women noticed it. It resembles the Star of David, a symbol, however, that did not become an indicator of Judaism until after 1900. It can, however, be a Solomon's seal. In 2007, I proposed that connotation and that the churches meant it as a symbolic sealed, a shield against disease. In that sense, by means of an outward-facing snippet, Olana as a whole became an amulet against future family calamity. Same year, 1879, same month, May 1879. This exactly contemporary Victorian painting involving a horse. It's by a woman, Elizabeth Thompson, by then known by her married title, Lady Butler, there she is, of herself, by herself. Hers is a war picture, a retrospective but timely, sorry about this, for the date, depiction for Britain and really timely for us in ours. Thompson debuted hers at London's Royal Academy Exhibit of Art in May 1879. She 
titled it, The Remnants of an Army, Jalalabad, January 13, 1842. The scene recreates an actual event in 1842, the return of the first and initially believed sole survivor of the British Army's mortifying defeat at and retreat from Kabul, Afghanistan. That's right, Kabul, to Jalalabad. At first, it seems that only one person, a British medical doctor, had lived from a force of about 16,000. Later, a few further survivors emerged. The doctor had struggled to Jalalabad on an exhausted horse, which soon died. The theme was propitious because the year before Ms. Thompson completed her canvas, 1878, the British had re-engaged in, Afga in Afghanistan. At first, results looked favorable, but by the end of 1879, the Brits were suffering reverses in faraway places. Again. Thompson's painting was a British sensation in 1879. Word about it spread quickly, widely, notably via Frederick Church's hometown of Hartford, Connecticut. A correspondent of the Hartford Courant newspaper was then in London. Right. From there, that Connecticut Yankee, whose name I don't know, penned a lengthy letter about the Royal Academy display. He had been privileged to reconnoiter it on Varnishing Day, a preview occasion when attendees could talk to artists. The American writer applauded Thompson's remnants of an army, and he spoke with her. She told him about her inspiration for it, having originated years earlier by a pronouncement from her father. She returned to her father's idea in printed form in her biography or autobiography published in 1922, but she had said so in front of the picture back in 1879. Because the American had come from far away from a particular place, did he mention Frederick Church's name? I'm from, you know who, well, anyway, she may have been more forthcoming than usual. Okay, she told the same tale to others that day and to visitors to her studio. The Hartford chap wrote it down. In the early 20th century, Lady Butler published and republished a book embellished with her own watercolor illustrations Letters from the Holy Land. She'd visited there with her husband in 1891. Their quadruped transports were horses, but she saw and mentioned camels. As had myriad predecessors, British and continental artists of the 19th century depicted war scenes. Sculptures of armed conflicts go back to ancient Mediterranean times. And of course, there'd been a really big quarrel, partly involving horses, across Middle North America, 1861 to 1865. Days into that struggle, Frederick Church brushed a rapid sketch of a flag-suggestive sunrise. Titled Our Banner in the Sky, Church intended it as a Union booster. That image was quickly printed in colors and marketed by Michael, Michael Nerdler, Church's dealer. In 1864, on the right now, for a private patron, Church painted a larger, still not very big, fictive flag landscape titled Our Flag. Friends of the artist and the owner saw it, but probably the public didn't. Several years ago, I noticed that certain Photographs taken by Union photographers in the defeated Confederacy resembled paintings by Church of a few years later depicting classical ruins in Syria. This is one of those photographs in Columbia, South Carolina. And this is a Church painting I'm referring to of 1869 called, at the time, that's a legitimate old title, Valley of the Lebanon his painted second such after ruins at Baalbek. This more specifically reimagined, reimaged Baalbek in the Bacow Valley. He painted the 1869 picture, this one entirely in Rome. 
the largest temple at Baalbek had over centuries been reduced by earthquakes, storms, and gravity to six columns. Church, in his painting, shrank it by three more, the nerve of the guy. Church, here's the site as it actually is of a couple of years ago. Church imaged the century-old site as inherently but slowly impermanent. The South Carolina ruins, visually fetching if you didn't live there, had abrupt ruinations and very short afterlifes. Evidently, church collected no such images. So did recent American photographs of the American South help explain Syria-themed paintings by a contemporary American artist? I'd say a little. Were those images of a few years apart using different media and depicting differing geographies kindred in terms of context or meaning? I would say yes to that. Notwithstanding Frederick Church's public hour banner and his private hour flag, I have long doubted that his other studio paintings done just before, during, or after the Civil War were war demonstrative. Rainy season in the tropics comes closest. As long ago as 1966, the great, late, great historian of American art, David C. Huntington, who revived Frederick Church for the modern era, termed this painting, the ne plus ultra of hope. He meant in part the Civil War, the end of the war. FYI, Mr. Church had notioned that picture double ray mode included during the war, but finished it a year afterward. In 1966, Dr. Huntington was also implicating literature and the fine arts of distant and near pasts of varied topographies actual and imagined. That seems right enough. For example, this uh, mid-17th mid century Dutch landscape painting by Jakob van Rysdale entitled The Jewish Cemetery, and this early 19th century English picture of Salisbury from the Water Meadows by John Constable. The American Civil War, let's see what we need to do here, yes. Go back to here. The American Civil War did not occur in the equatorial tropics. Supposing for a moment that Church's compatriots could find allegory pertaining to themselves in foreign geographies, did Frederick Church do another war picture ever? I would say that he did, inferentially as usual rather than explicitly, but this time with proper geography. I mean his Aegean Sea, 1878. The painting is totally composed. No place on earth looks or ever has looked like that. His Aegean Sea reminds immediately of his rainy season in the tropics, but the earlier picture is bright, excuse me, and less insistent on details, and the later one darken and more insistent on its. In his later years, Church became deliberately a traditionalist an art of the museum's painter. In a short editorial praising his debut of Church's Aegean, uh, uh, praising the debut of Church's Aegean Sea at the Century Association in New York, early April 1878, the New York World newspaper noted that the picture had, quote, what the French call an interest in, of circumstance, unquote. The circumstance of, to which the writer alluded was threefold, the main portion being the Russo-Turkish conflict, 1877 to 78, its buildup and aftermath. Most Europeans and Americans hoped the Russians would prevail the clash, and the Russians did dominate. But Church's painting looks like a Turkish Muslim triumph. Russians were not identifiably, identifiably Mediterranean. Turks were and had been for millennia. A seaside quasi Constantinople, and we're talking about that feature at the far right there, complete with redoubtable domed mosque and spiky minaret, flourishes at the scenes far right. With Naria Russian, anything, anywhere in sight. 
Churches double rainbow promises or recommends peace. When a few weeks later the Aegean Sea was re-exhibited in New York, local and out-of-town newspaper writers welcomed it in the process, making it church's most beloved late painting. So how can we tune in or tune back in on this? How about by this? This is an 1868 American recycle of an 1830s origin British book engraving derived from an 18-teens sketch by an English traveler author named of James Morier. I think it helps tune us into 1870s Anglo-American mentalities about the Mediterranean. This black and white scene depicts Mount Ararat, an actual snow-capped summit associated with Noah's Ark in the Old Testament. Mr. Church, as it happened, owned an illustrated book by Moyer published in 1819, which provided the source of the name for his house, Olana. That book was given him to, his, to him by his wife in, wait for it, year 1879. The Mount Ararat prints, there were two of them, this is the latter-day version of the, and the earlier one, appeared in illustrated books of those separated dates, 1830s and 1860s, concerning the Bible. The voluminous English publication was topographical throughout. Illustratively, the more, even more profuse American book published in Norris, Connecticut, which you're seeing a print from here, was a miscellany. The American book commenced its in-volume pictorials with a scene by Nicolas Poussin, the 17th century French expatriate painters who had wrote, worked in Rome. And this scene imagines the biblical deluge. Church, we recall, did one such scene himself also. Poussin's original was one of four 1660s paintings by him now in the Louvre depicting the four seasons. Poussin's cycle of four ended with winter, this scene, as biblical flood. In other words, Old Testament fatalism. The American book of two centuries later opened with Judeo-Christian warning, attested, as it were, by Poussin. By then, Poussin was regarded in the US as a historical artist of flawless character. In the American book, the print of Mount Ararat under a rainbow appears two pages after the print of Poussin's deluge. At least to that extent, there was semblance of salvation. Well, back to Félix Bonfils. 1831 to 85, the principal photographer working in Lebanon from the 1860s onwards, he had recently migrated to Beirut from France. Be Bonfils and his assistants eventually photographed all over the Mediterranean, often for tourist sales, also picturing tourists themselves. In Beirut, Mr. and Mrs. Church and their young son, Frederick Joseph, were among Bonfils's early clients that Bonfils was French and moved to Lebanon was historically appropriate. Lebanon had been French influenced or French dominated since the Crusades. In 1860, the French had built the first ever passable road between Beirut and Damascus. Eight years later, Frederick and Isabel Church, Mrs. Cart, Carnes of separately from her kin, and Susan Hale and her sister, among others, all had advantaged that roadway in both directions. In the late 1870s, Bonfils published a sequence of photograph books which he titled Souvenirs of the Orient, with caption pages conveniently in three European languages. The compilations included several views of Baalbek's ruins. In going where he did, doing what he did, Bonfils retraced over periods of time paths trod by prior European and even a few American topographical artists, among them Frederick Church. This is an 1830s British print derived from an 1819 drawing by Charles Barry 
depicting what is now called a Temple of Bacchus at Baalbek. Its foremost feature is the huge wobbly keystone of the building's main entrance. Barry and others knew that Lebanon was earthquake prone. A generation later, mid-1850s, in turn, the New York publishers Harper's employed an American engraver who expanded, redeveloped, and reversed the London Baalbek print of the 1830s. The mirrored images reminds of etching by Giovanni Battista Piranese, the late 18th century Italian proponent of ancient Rome's grandeur. When Bonfils pictured ostensibly the same Balkus project, uh, prospect, but he pictures it correctly, whereas the printmaker had flopped it. The shaky keystone had been propped up by a stone by stone, vertical upright. Other photographers depicted this scene as well. At the turn of the 20th century, though, the temple floor was cleared, completely cleared. Prior to that, the wayward keystone had been shoved back into place and its surface had smoothed. This is what it looked like a couple of years ago. I think it's fantastic. I thought so then. Changes notwithstanding, I can attest that Baalbek's Bacchus is among the finest Mediterranean ruined spaces anywhere. When Frederick Church walked the Bacchus himself, May 1868, dodging clutter, he looked straight ahead and down not up. I looked up. He didn't. Not that I can notice. Turning northeastward, he focused on oversized fallen fragments strewn among dirt piles along the temple's north wall. Several photographers of the period, including Bofis, took negatives of nearly the same scene, but Church's is superior to all of theirs as visual presentation. The deftly unfinished result, oil brushed over pencil outlines is, I think, his finest transcript of a classical ruin. Church cherished that sketch. He returned to it and referred to it in four of his subsequent Mediterranean studio paintings, including his very first Ruins at Baalbek, 1868. So, where are we, finally, with that studio painting? First and foremost, where Church himself had never gone before, he was testing himself before sending it to its owner, who by then had returned to the US, Church showed it to friends of his in his rented studio in Rome. He reported that those persons liked the finished painting. That itself was a big deal. Shortly after arriving Rome, October 1868, Church became annoyed at art groupies swarming that town, most of them boorish, except that they wanted to rub elbows with artists. Church was annoyed. He stayed annoyed. The next spring, 1869, sorry, he went to Greece partly to exit Italy. He really liked Greece. How affecting might Church's ruins at Baalbek painting have been for him, the artist, or the buyer? The patron was the chap on the right, Edward Floyd Delancey, 1821-1905, a New York-based lawyer and in later life oft-published historian of colonial and federalist America. As a youth, Delancey had toured Europe with his own father, and 1868, uh, 67 and 68, he went abroad again, apparently solo. Much as were Frederick and Isabel Church and Mrs. Carnes, the mother-in-law, uh, Delancey was then beset by familial grief. His wife, Josephine, had recently died, as, as had his own father. Edward and Josephine had had six children, only two of whom lived to maturity. A daughter named Frances Monroe Delancey had passed away in June 1867, age 12. Probably her mother and father had believed their daughter was beyond early age danger. Those sorrowful occurrences doubtless 
factored Delancey's ensuing transatlantic travels, especially his circuit of the Holy Land and Eastern Mediterranean, which he had not visited earlier. The private reverberations of churches' ruins at Baalbek, the Lebanon Mountains, would not have precluded churches' guests in Rome or Delancey's in the US from access to it. Problem is, we know next to nothing about that. After December 1868, the canvas not having yet arrived in the US, accepting two brief references in Delancey family papers from the 1890s and 1920s, documentation pertaining to us, it ceases. The painting was not publicly exhibited. Did Delancey ho-hum or dislike it once he'd seen it? If so, he would have disagreed with everything that Church had told him in advance and that he himself had anticipated. Church's Valley of the Lebanon, 1869, which I show you again, helps unlock his ruins at Baalbek, 1868. The same size 1869 canvas depicted a desert ambiance with nearby ruins, distant castle and incipient moonrise. There the depicted architecture was comparatively ample, the firmament and staffage intricate and the environment entirely inland. Yet that image too is austere. And that painting was publicly presented at the time and responded to by American press writers. Those situations occurred because the intended patron, a Brit, turned it down flat. So Church reluctantly consigned it to the art market to, through his Manhattan dealer, Michael Nerdler. Nerdler, in turn, spoke for it when journalists and potential buyers dropped by late 1869. Soon, a Chicago railway mogul purchased it. The latter-day irony is that through two 1990s East Coast dealers, that painting disappeared about 30 years ago. It hasn't been seen since, not by anybody I know of. The futility occurred despite my having identified it at the time as a particular, the picture historically titled properly, Valley of the Lebanon. Modern day collectors continued to prefer Mr. Church in his Western hemisphere guises. I show it to you via a 1990s transparency. It is, as I pointed out, Baalbek rethought and rearranged. In New York, late 1869, that painting received insightful press write-ups. The commentary I'm about to read, and am concluding this talk, befits it. There, Church's then newfound uh, sense sensitivities toward geographical oldness, including the writers and nerdlers and churches' implicit chauvinisms are well expressed. The writer's remarks reply almost equally to church's ruins at Baalbek. The comment about this painting, 1869, reads, another very interesting picture in Mr. Nerdler's gallery is a reflection of Mount Lebanon brought home from the Orient by Mr. Church. It may or may not be a good topographical, land, uh, topographical landscape, and we do not suppose that it is, but it is, it is imbued with Oriental sentiment and satisfi satisfies the cravings of the imagination. In the general aspects of the picture, we recognize none of the traces of Mr. Church's Western pictures. The whole atmosphere is different the treatment is tender, subdued, and solemn. It is the dead East and not the living West. The color is laid on very thin, and the texture is slight and feeble, but the effect is soft and soothing. Without the figure of the Arab, or the camel, or the ruined pillar, or the overthrown shrine, we should know that the scene represented belonged to a region which had outlived, had outlived its old civilization, and had not awakened to a new one. Thank you.
I will. If I can see you, thank you. I can see better without my glasses than with them. I had a cataract operation a few weeks ago and I'm still trying to figure things out. Chauvinism, first of all. Western chauvinism, America for Americans, or the Western Hemisphere for Western Hemispheres. Uh, but churches, uh, Western Hemisphere pictures, I would say, are more dramatic, generally, uh, than his Eastern Hemisphere pictures. This is not universally the case, uh, but um, the color balances are wider range. There's more red, there's more green. Think about this, many of several of church's major tropical scenes and even Western Hemisphere scenes generally, including Niagara, are basically green or blue-green. Church was well known for paintings that were red or reddish, but his subtleties as a color manipulator within narrow ranges, uh, he expressed himself in the mid uh, 1860s as a painter who wanted to be known for uh, color subtleties and atmospheric gradations, which he turned to his advantage, he thought, when he went to the Mediterranean, but with, in that case, paintings which looked like they've been varnished for decades or even centuries already, and he just painted them comparatively. He became more of an old masterish picture maker. And um, his earlier Western Hemisphere pictures, for the most part, his very early ones are dark and light and, well, but he evolved a much more um, rainbow-esque um, spectrum of uh, color. And he kept at it even into the 1870s. His tropical pictures have, of the 1870s have more a vibrancy and way more green uh, than his uh, Near Eastern pictures. And by the way, he wasn't asking us what we thought. He was asking at most, and he, I think he did ask, but maybe he didn't pay a whole lot of attention. Uh, he did things his way and what he wanted and what he wanted was a career turn or at least an aesthetic implantation from places that Myriad people had gone and depicted South America. Very few artists had gone. Even North America, not nearly so many as had seen Jerusalem, much less tried to picture it in one way or another. So when Church went to um, Italy, but also the Southern Mediterranean, he was retrading uh, places that artists had gone for generations, even centuries before. In the Western Hemisphere, he was a lot less so. Anyway, Americans like that. American literature and American art criticism of the time is filled with uh, American chauvinism. It is. Uh, this is our world, and our world has been unimagined by anybody from over there until they got here and they couldn't believe their eyes. Yeah. Is the Moorish looking home still in existence? Now which? Is the Moorish looking home that he's still Oh, yeah, absolutely. It's a historic site. It was uh, nominated as a, a New York historic site uh, um, preserved since 1966. And um, it was touch and go. Um, what happened was that a very long generation lived after, lived there after Frederick and Isabel died. And that was their daughter-in-law and she died in 1964, I believe. Anyway, two years of um, uncertainty uh, accrued after that and uh, there was even a possibility that the uh, house might be demolished or turned into a school or something like that. Well, fortunately, my uh, late great mentor and PhD advisor, David Huntington, he uh, thought it 
um, worthy of her crusade and helped by uh, numbers of other people, but he was the principal church expert. He got it saved. And uh, in the era of the pandemic of the last year and a half, it has uh, had a reduced visitation by a lot. But they are apparently gearing well back up, and I'm going to go up there next week. I was prevented from going up there last year by uh, COVID-19. Yeah. Yes. I'm sorry, I can't hear you very well. Yeah. <laughs> what connection was there? <laughs> it varies a lot, I think. The ar or the arc. Of, okay. Yes. Yes. He's going the opposite way. Yes. Rainy season in the tropics. Yes. Church was, by the late 1850s, already very good at rainbows, not of that scale usually. Uh, but uh, in his painting of Niagara of 1857, there are a couple of glints of rainbow and uh, one of them apparently deceived the English critic, John Ruskin, who would have first seen it in 1857 or 58 when it was exhibited in England, that the story is Ruskin went to a window and tried to put his hand in front of the painting to see if it was a glint from the window. It was, no, it was painted. Church could do that stuff. He could paint prisms and atmosphere. And he put a big rainbow into his next big painting of Niagara in 1866-7 as well. But there is, interestingly for me anyhow, there's a sketch that survives of churches of an idea for a Niagara painting more or less like the one in 1857 he did paint with a double arc of a rainbow over it. He changed his mind, but he and essentially uh, he, he uh, put that back into the painting called uh, Rainy Season in the Tropics. As for um, uh, Turner's, Turner's color key uh, almost goes to white uh, by the end, and unintelligibly, as far as I know, to Turner's contemporaries, they could make less and less sense of his late work. Or even some of his works as far back as the 1830s. Uh, Church, when he went to England, had seen, uh, because a collector for whom he worked had owned, only two uh, legitimate oil paintings by Turner. And both of them uh, well, neither of them was totally as characteristic of Turner as Turner's uh, legacy in England had been. Uh, one of them is at Yale and the other is in a private collection in England. Anyhow, um, one of the, to me, one of the remarkable things about the painting in the adjoining room is that it's way subtler than 
church paint, the, the Turner paintings by church, uh, that, that that church saw in London once he got there and saw them in all, all kinds of quantities and sizes and finish and unfinish. Uh, he did take Turner literally. Uh, he didn't try to do what Turner did, literally. In a way, a painting by Church called Syria by the Sea, which is a large seven-foot canvas of 1873 with a big, bold sun right in the middle, that has always looked to me as though Church painted it in a way to correct Turner, to say that this is how Church believes Turner ought to have painted it. Turner could have, but Church could. And that by then was the time of the painting called The Slave Ship, which came over in uh, the early 1870s and caused a huge stir. It's in Boston now. And it was hugely controversial as well as rapturous. Some people thought it was the death of painting, and this is any, isn't anywhere near what Impressionism became, especially late Impressionism. So, uh, in some ways, these questions uh, redound, as far as I'm concerned, to what is art, or what was art then, or what, it was what, what was it supposed to be? It was for artists. Yes. Someone who has worked so long on this material, I just wondered if you had maybe a fun story discovering something more recently. And, and I thought, uh, you know, in a way, we have hope for students and other researchers, but there's still more out there. I, I wondered if you might be able to share something. An aha moment. <laughs> 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 I'm not sure I'd be able to point conclusively to any one thing or two. But I could tell you that one of the reasons I've been interested and continue to be interested in Frederick Church for the length of time I've been, which is, I dare say, about 40 years. I didn't start off as a PhD student doing church, but I eventually came round to him. And that, even by that, even that by now was 40 years ago. Well. Um, one of the things that keeps me interested is that there are still, as far as I'm concerned, new things to find out and new things to figure out, and insights, or at least cognates, kindrednesses. Uh, for example, a thing I put in, and it may have not seemed so interesting to you, but it was to me, years ago in a New York newspaper I noticed thumbing through a microfilm of a newspaper, that there was this response in May 1879 to a response. And the response was to Elizabeth Thompson's Lady Butler's remnants of an army. And this report said that the correspondent of the Hartford Current talked to Lady Butler and she told him thus and such. And she did. As far as I'm aware, the modern aware uh, cognizance of Lady Butler, there have been two book-sized publications about her, one in 1987 and one just a couple of years ago. And I think only the later one talks about her father's having inspired her to paint the painting called The Remnants of the Army. I don't think there's any reference to documentation having come from her own voice in 1879 in front of the painting by anybody. Well, I found it interesting, I mean really interesting, that a guy from Hartford, Church's hometown, who was Frederick Church, might Lady Butler have heard of her even if some of the other, most of the other gallery, gallery goers hadn't. A painting by Church had not visited London for 10 years. Up to then, it visited London something by him every three or four years. Well, anyway, 
did the Hor Hartford Current correspondent name drop? Well, if he did, I know what name he would have used. He would have used Fred's name. Anyway, whoever this guy was, and I assume he was a guy, but I don't know that, the correspondent, she told him right in front of the painting with an earshot of other people who, I don't know whether they wrote it down. A guy from Hartford wrote it down. Anyway, there's this fairly new biography of Lady Butler, and it barely makes it into the biography that her father had inspired her to paint this picture by having related to her this um, a tale from the 1840s. How does word about art or what artists do or what they might do or what they should do get around? It gets around by all kinds of devices and one of the ways I've tried to retrace these is through uh, published, especially periodical and newspaper references of the period. They're filled with stuff. Of course, they have lots of things that you wish they'd said, but they didn't. Or you know they heard, but they didn't write down. Or for that matter, Isabel Church kept a diary for portions of their 1868 uh, trip. And she was quite assiduous about the early weeks of it. And she was very assiduous about the period of time, up to six weeks, when her dear Frederick was away at dangerous trekking toward and from Petra. And she writes effusively, and she's, how oh, I, my dear Fred, and I want to see him, and I'm this, uh, spiritually wasted person and I'm sinful and anyway when he gets back she stops writing <laughs> and of course she's overwhelmed to see him she doesn't have to emote about herself and about her anxieties anymore he's back but I don't have to ask I know that he couldn't shut up he just talked and talked and talked and she listened but she didn't write any of it down and I wish she had fortunately he wrote two or three letters to other people and we have those and probably what he said to her much resembled what he wrote to those other people to his own wife <laughs> Ha, ha, ha.